Okay, so here's my overview. I'm going to start with the history, and I know that several of the lectures today have mentioned TTS, but I'm going to, for those of you who aren't as quite as familiar with it, I'm going to do a little bit more of the basic background of it. Also, um, there are experts in the room on TTS who you can talk to as well, um, so this might be a little familiar to them. Okay, so um, in, in the end of January of 2021, um, the first vaccine started being rolled out in Europe with um, about a quarter of the vaccines being given to frontline health workers in Germany being the AstraZeneca uh, Chimpadox um, COVID-19 vaccine. And the index case, um, as reported in this New England Journal paper, was a 49-year-old healthcare worker who got her first dose of the vaccine, of the Oxford vaccine, in mid-February. And after her vaccine, she felt a little bit of a headache, fatigue, myalgias. Those started to get better, but by about five days after her vaccine, she developed fevers, chills, nausea, and abdominal pain. This continued to progress, and she was admitted to hospital on day 10 after she was back, um, after the vaccination, and she was found to have very low platelets. Um, an elevated D-dimer, which is a measure of platelet consumption and clotting, um, and they thought maybe she had COVID on top of uh, um, uh, as part of her illness, and but she was SARS-CoV-2 PCR negative. A CT scan showed portal vein thrombosis and clots in her pulmonary um, veins, and her thromboses progressed throughout the course of the day, and by the next day, she had a massive gastrointestinal bleed and died. And the autopsy showed that in addition to what had been seen on her CT scans prior to death, she had clots in her cerebral veins, which is really uncommon, um, in addition to other findings. And over the course of the next few days, there is more cases reported throughout the UK and the European countries um, that are using the AstraZeneca vaccine. And because of this, Multiple countries halt administration while the WHO and the EMA review the data that was available. And at the time, they um, recommended that the, the benefit of the vaccine outweighed any potential risks. Um, recall at that time, people were dying of COVID at very high numbers, and we didn't have a lot of vaccine options. And so most countries resumed the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, but some, such as Denmark, never did. Um, so this is a WHO statement, March of 2021, that reports some rare blood co uh, coagulation disorders after the, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. We know that people do have clots, but these clots are a little bit unusual. We don't know at this point if the clots are related to the vaccine, but even if they were, they thought that the risk-benefit ratio was worth, that the benefits of vaccination outweighed any potential risks. So what was going on? Um, this was a new syndrome um, called in the United States thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. In other countries, it's called vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT. Um, and a thrombosis is a clot um, in a blood vessel. Thrombocytopenia, by definition, is low platelet, so a platelet count less than 150,000 per microliter. And a platelet count, normal platelet count, is 150 to 450,000 per microliter, so quite low platelet count. Um, and then CVST is something, oopsie, um, that you, that we'll talk about in the central venous sinus thrombosis. This is a, a very frequently shown picture now of the veins of the brain and the veins are draining the blood from the brain back into, back to, towards the heart. Um, and they come together in these, um, sinuses. Um, and the sinuses come all come together in this confluence of sinuses, and veins are a very low pressure system. So the walls of veins are thin. Um, if a clot were to happen in a vein, the clot can cause backup of the blood that's trying to drain, and the pressure that builds up behind that clot can overwhelm the thick the the force of the walls' ability to hold the blood. So not only can you have a um, not only do you have a problem with the blood return if you have a clot in the vein, but you often run the risk of having a bleed in the brain or hemorrhage in the brain because of the, um, the pressure in the brain. So how do blood clots form? When there is, um, we have in our bodies, in our bloodstream, there is a very fine balance between pro-clotting factors and anti-clotting factors that keep us in really nice homeostasis so we're not clotting all the time, but we don't bleed excessively when we get cut. Um, at the site of an injury, 
the blood activates, notices the vascular endothelium that's injured will release factors that attract platelets. The platelets are activated. They release something called platelet factor four and they become sticky. Um, they activate clotting factors, which convert um, prothrombin to thrombin, and that converts fibr fibrin fibrinogen, which is soluble, to fibrin, which is insoluble. And this, then you get this clot that is a net of red blood cells, platelets, and fibrin that block the hole so that we don't bleed. Um, we've seen this before in a syndrome called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where you have both clotting and bleeding. Um, and um, and in this and in this syndrome, the platelet factor four um, granules are very positively charged. And heparin, which is an anticoagulant that we use therapeutically for many syndromes, is a very negatively charged compound. And the two attract each other. So you have platelet factor four um, binding to the negatively charged heparin, and for some reason that changes the conformation. And Dr. Everhart talked about autoimmunity and the fact that we can recognize self from non-self. Well, when it changes the conformation, the platelet factor for heparin compounds now look like non-self. And so in some people, they can make antibodies to this. And it's those antibodies that when they bind to this com the, the complex, bind to platelets, activate platelets, and cause platelets to bind to each other and activate and form clots, it also causes... Um, the consumption of these platelets because the spleen is trying to clear um, circulating activated platelets to keep them from causing problems. And so your platelets drop and you get thrombocytopenia where they fall in your platelet count, you get thrombosis or clots, and then you can have bleeding. There is a test to measure for this heparin um, phenomenon, and it's an anti-PF4 autoantibody that can be um, measured using an ELISA. So we had a test for the phenomenon before we had um, the new syndrome that was recognized. How, um, what is happening after the the um, the adenovirus vectored vaccines? So the hypothesis is that after vaccination, the vaccine forms a complex with these platelet factor four molecules, and that then triggers the production of antibodies um, by B cells that recognize the platelet factor four adenovirus compound complex that then causes activation of platelets, causing the, the clots and, um, and the bleeding. And so even though we know what the process is, we don't know what triggers it. And why, and I've talked a lot about this to Noni today, why do some, a very few number of people get this syndrome, but most people who are vaccinated don't? Um, there have been a lot of um, hypotheses, several different hypotheses as to the proposed mechanism. The one that I um, talked about last year that seemed to give a really good answer, but I don't think has been replicated by other groups, is the fact that the surface of the adenovirus um, vectors are really negatively charged. This is a chimp adox virus, and this is the um, Janssen at 26 virus. And the more orange, um, more orange you are, the more negatively charged you are. And you can see that chimp adox is more negatively charged. And because of the negative charge, platelet factor four binds to the surface of the viruses. Um, and so this, this is a, an electron image of the platelet factor four in red binding to the surface of the virus. And because um, this binding happens in a rare um, number of patients, these trigger the autoantibodies that allow the activation of platelets. There are other um, proposed hypotheses. One of them is that uh, one of them involves the role of neutrophils in the, um, in the pathophysiology of this. Um, when neutrophils are activated, they release something called, um, they produce something called neutrophil extracellular traps, which, um, is a, basically as the neutrophils are dying, they're releasing their DNA. The DNA unravels, is attached to histones and other proteins and forms a trap, um, to capture pathogens. But in the process, it's also releasing a lot of, Inflammatory molecules, calprotectin and myeloperoxidase, and these um, cause vascular endothelial damage, so they damage blood vessels, 
leading to platelet activation. They also promote clots um, to form. So um, there have been several groups that have explored the hypothesis that TTS is related to this net or netosis um, phenomenon. And they found that people who have, um, who've had TTS, they found um, calprotectin elevated, they found D-dimer levels elevated, myeloperoxidase elevated, and, and um, the products of net. So talked a little bit about the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. What about um, the Janssen vaccine and what happened in the United States? Um, this is what I'm more familiar with. So in February um, of 2021, the US FDA authorized, gave, gave emergency use authorization for the uh, Johnson & Johnson or the Janssen um, adenovirus vector vaccine by March um, 2nd that was first available in the United States. And within just a few weeks of the vaccine being available, we heard about the first case, which was a woman who was in her 40s who got um, the first, the, the Janssen vaccine within six days after vaccination. She developed a mild headache that per became persistent and wouldn't go away despite symptomatic therapy. Um, 11 days later, um, she her headache got worse. And then she started having left-sided weakness and so went to the emergency room where she was admitted. Um, she was found to have low platelets, a large uh, right-sided um, bleed in her brain, clot in her transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus of her brain, and she died very quickly after admission. Um, with It was within just a few days um, that the um, that six cases in total were reported by physicians in the United States, leading to this um, CDC health alert of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis um, in patients who had received the, um, the Janssen vaccine. And the CDC halted the use of the vaccine in the United States until it had been investigated further. At the same time, so this was on April 13th, at the same time, the WHO had also done a review of the adenovirus vector vaccines, and they felt that um, they it, it was likely to be associated with these um, very rare events of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. Um, they felt that this was due to a platform-specific mechanism, but that the risk is low because these events are fairly rare. And um, that each country should perform its own risk-benefit ratio based on its own context. Um, looking at local epidemiology, the age groups targeted for vaccination and the availability of alternate vaccines. Um, it, there was a predominance of women who were um, presenting with this syndrome. And so they said we needed a better understanding of sex-related risk. And that clinicians needed to be aware that persistent headaches were a potential warning sign of this syndrome and to um, evaluate people. Um, who reported with them. There was also seemed to be some geographic differences and that needed to be better studied. So back in the United States, um, in on April 23rd, the CDC um, ACIP met um, and reviewed the benefits and harms of resuming vaccination um, with the Janssen vaccine, looking at the number of hospitalizations and deaths that would be averted with the use of the vaccine versus the potential number of um, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome um, that would develop. And because of the limited number of vaccines and the, and the limited data um, event, they, um, they thought that the benefits of using the vaccine outweighed the potential risks. However, they did put a warning on um, the use of vaccine for women under the age of 50 as they seem to be at greater risk. Um, Every few weeks, the, the reviews in many countries continue to go on. In the United States, it was reviewed again in July. And again, and at this time, not only were there additional cases of TTS after vaccination, but there was also new reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome after the vaccine. And by December of um, 2021, the ACIP made the preferential recommendation that people should get the mRNA vaccine over um, the the um, adenovirus vectored vaccine in the United States. And um, the following year, in, in May of last year, the FDA put a warning on this. Um, this was the um, risk-benefit analysis in December of 2021 that showed that um, the continued use of the Janssen vaccine would save um, a significant number of hospitalizations in both men in blue and women in, in red. 
of all age groups um, at the cost of um, a small number of TTS cases, um, but especially in the younger age group. Um, despite the fact that the overwhelming evidence showed that there would be benefit, um, the risks as more vaccines became available in the United States, the risks associated with these adenovirus vectored vaccines were felt to be too great. And so therefore, um, the vectored vaccines were, the vector vaccine, uh, the Anson vaccine was made um, less preferential over the mRNA vaccines. Um, and this decision was um, published in the MMWR um, but be, even before this was published, um, there was a, a, a significant amount of outcry from other parts of the world where there was less access to other vaccine options. And this is a, a very good vaccine that provides a significant amount of protection from COVID and COVID, um, severe COVID illness. So I'm going to take a step back now and talk about what the case definitions, what is TTS, um, and um, some of the, um, the, the monitoring and clinical findings. So um, in November of 2021, the uh, sort of final working Brighton Collaboration case definition of TTS came out. They um, gave it two levels, level one and level two. Level one is basically proven um, TTS. Um, and with the presence of thrombosis and thrombosis confirmed by imaging or sur surgical um, examination and an elevated D-dimer level, um, level two, and both of them require low platelet levels without the presence of heparin. Um, level two um, is uh, strongly suggestive, but without the proven evidence of um, imaging in, in, because not everywhere um, do people have the option to image. The CDC also had their definition that we used in the United States, where um, every single case of, of suspected TTS was adjudicated by a, um, a, a, a CISA hematologist and, and um, vaccine scientists. And so they went through every case and decided whether it met the definition um, or didn't. But as you can see, it's very similar to the Brighton definition. You need a platelet count less than 150,000. You need to have an unusual clot or a clot in normal plates with anti-PF4 antibodies. We have the luxury of having this test available in most places in the United States. And so it's part of the definition. There are many other definitions. The WHO has a definition. MHRA has a definition. And so because of that, it's a little bit hard to compare across sites because um, different cases may or may not meet um, various definitions. Um, but what are the symptoms? The symptoms tend to be um, fairly similar. So the onset usually happens between 5 and 30 days, although it could be recognized after 30 days um, if the symptoms take longer to present. Um, the most common symptom is severe headache, sometimes progressively worsening, um, that's resistant to symptomatic treatment. Um, there can be severe persistent abdominal pain or back pain. Um, if there's clots in the, in the, um, in the abdomen, um, if there's a, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, there can be focal neurological symptoms such as weakness, blurry vision, double vision seizures. Um, it, um, shortness of breath, um, if there's pulmonary emboli or chest pain. And then if there's clots in the legs, you can have leg swelling or redness. There have been um, a couple of case series looking at um, people with uh, TTS in the UK and the US. So this is um, the UK case series. And again, they're very similar in terms of their findings. 50% um, of people who present have clots in the brain and a significant portion of them have bleeding in the brain because of it. A lot have um, pulmonary emboli or um, emboli in, in, in unusual places. Um, their presentation is um, usually five to forty is is about fourteen days after the AstraZeneca vaccine in the U.S. Most people were women. Um, sorry, this is the U.K. Most people were women, and the median age in the U.K. was forty eight years of age. The mortality rate was twenty two percent, and the vast majority of people who had um, PF four testing were found to be anti PF four antibody positive. This is the case series that was published in the United States. Again, about half the people had clots in the brain. Um, it was 54 cases that presented. 69% of them were female. Most of them were Caucasian. Um, the median age was 44. Um, and the median time to symptoms onset was nine days. Um, 
we had a 15% hosp- uh, fatality rate, but of those who survived, 17% of them were unable to leave the hospital and return to a normal home. They had to go to rehab, suggesting they had significant neurological or other um, deficits upon um, discharge. So these are really, really sick people. Um, the risk factors for mortality are, are the, the biggest risk factors if you have bleeding in the brain. So this is an image of a 50-year-old man who has a large bleed here. And these images show um, on venogram the absence of the filling of the veins, um, the sinuses in the brain, and the external jugular artery, uh, vein here. He also had a pulmonary embolism. So people who um, had bleeding in the brain, had a much higher risk of dying in the United States. Those who um, died really died very quickly after admission to the hospital before there was time to treat them. Um, and um, symptoms for these people generally began within 7 to 14 days after vaccination. So if you um, are taking care of somebody who is suspected to have TTS, it's really important to do a careful history to understand when they were vaccinated and what vaccines they received. This has been seen after um, adenovirus vector vaccines. It has not been seen after mRNA vaccines. Um, uh, suggestive symptoms, especially, sorry, especially um, headaches. Um, it's important to exclude other possible, uh, possible alternative diagnoses. If they were on heparin, it could just be hit. Um, it's important to do a platelet count because that's the number one criteria for the definition. It needs to be under 150,000, a D-dimer level. And there's a whole host of labs and imaging that can support the diagnosis or rule it out. The WHO has published very nice guidelines for the management of people with suspected TTS. And the important things are people should be hospitalized and closely monitored. They should not get platelet transfusions because that just leads to more consumption of platelets. Um, and they should also not get um, heparin-based anticoagulants because, because the syndrome is so similar to HIT, we don't want to give them a a compound that could potentially trigger HIT. And so you um, do want to anticoagulate them. You want to give them something to stop the clotting, but you want to give something that's not based in heparin. Um, IV um, immunoglobulins, so basically um, ge generic antibodies that can be transfused into people um, have been shown to be very effective in autoimmune-like disorders in terms of blocking, saturating um, the antibodies and and helping with the um, helping stop the syndrome the process from happening. So IV immunoglobulins do help in severe disease, um, and if that's not available, then steroids can be administered. Um, and people have uh, there's been significant improvement in survival in people who've been able to get anticoagulation and immunoglobulins. So this is not a, um, this, this syndrome is not uniformly present um, at the same rate in all countries. And this was an early um, study looking at the rates of, um, of TTS, both all TTS and then fatal TTS in the, in the red in, um, in different countries. In the Nordic countries and overall in the EU, the rate was one to 100 per 100,000 doses of vaccine being administered. In Australia, um, it was a little bit lower, and um, and um, again, a little bit lower in Canada. But if you look in Asia and Brazil, um, where these vaccines were also used, the rates were much, much lower. And this has been shown in, in, in multiple studies, um, part, partly prob maybe because um, surveillance isn't quite as good, but even with active surveillance, the rates haven't been found to be as high. Um, and we know that the rates of um, the use of adenovirus vector vaccines really varied by country. So this is um, all the countries that report their data and um, is available to our, our world in data, most of them being European countries. Um, you can see that the majority of vaccines were mRNA based, um, with only a small proportion of the vaccines being um, in blue here, the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and in green below at the Janssen vaccine. But South Africa used a significant amount of the Janssen vaccine here. Argentina, um, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and Nepal had both um, vaccines available um, at um, fairly significant rates. And so um, even, but the country that used the most of the adenovirus vector vaccines is India, which was producing its own um, uh, Covishield and 1.8 billion doses of Covishield were given um, in India. 
um, with very, very little TTS um, seen. Um, so this was published in December of this past year. Um, it, it, the Indian government released that they'd seen very, very little rates of TTS. Um, of the 2.2 billion doses of Chimpadox vaccine that were released through September of 2022, there were 26 cases of TTS, um, 14 who had recovered and 12 died. This gave a, a rate of one per 100 million doses of vaccine, which is really, really different from the rate of one per 100,000 that's seen um, in um, in countries where the population is predominantly of European origin. Um, there are things that can be done to mitigate the risk of adenovirus vectored vaccines. Um, early detection and treatment of symptomatic patients who receive the adenovirus vac uh, vaccines is important, as is education of both patients and providers. Um, if there are higher risk people, such as young women who may be at more risk for developing this, prioritize other vaccines for them um, instead of giving them a, an adenovirus vector vaccines and to avoid it in people who have had a previous history of thrombosis. Um, and one of the big questions is this is, this is a phenomenon that's primarily, was primarily seen with the first dose of the vaccine. Um, at Janssen only had one dose, but with the, um, the Oxford vaccine, the second dose had much lower rates of TTS. And so in a population that is now no longer COVID naive, we've all been vaccinated, we've all had COVID, um, how big of a risk, um, is this in a population that's no longer COVID naive? And that's really an unanswered question. Despite this, many countries have abandoned these vaccines. Um, the United States, um, in the United States, we still have the Janssen vaccine authorized by the FDA, but the last dose has expired on May 7th and no additional doses will be purchased. Um, the, sorry, the last, um, the last doses in Australia were available March 20th. In the UK, there, um, uh, are no longer, um, uh, COVID, um, adenovirus vectored vaccines available. Um, so it seems like the, the high income countries has chosen no, to not um, have this vaccine anymore, which really um, leads to lots of questions about equity. Um, so in conclusion, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome is a very, very rare, potentially devastating adverse event. Um, after the receipt of an adenovirus vectored COVID-19 vaccine, it's because of, it happens because of antibodies to um, platelet factor four that lead to platelet activation, clotting, and consumption. The most common headache is uh, the most common sin symptom is headache, especially persistent headache that doesn't get better with treatment um, is a warning sign and people should be evaluated for TTS um, if they experience this. Um, we really need to have a better understanding of the rates in all countries, especially in countries with lower levels of reporting. Is it truly, um, is there a genetic component to this or is it, um, are there other factors that could be contributing to the differences in rates? And um, for many, the benefits of adenovirus vectored vaccines still far outweigh the risks, and these vaccines really saved a lot of lives. And so um, it's really important to remember that. Thank you for a beautiful lecture. Thank you. <laughs> yes, questions, please. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned that it would be interesting to, that there was higher incidence with the first um, yes. dose. But as I understood the mechanism, it seemed to be more related to the vector. So, I mean, I guess, right, or not the specific COVID-19 antigen, antigen that was inserted into the adenovirus. vector. Yes. So, I mean, is it possible that we see less incidence with the second dose because those who have a poor reaction aren't going back for a second dose if you're already kind of genetically predisposed to respond to that vector? And then... Also, how should we feel about the adenoviral vectors going forward? And so, so those are two really good questions. Um, the first is that um, that with the um, the the reaction is to the vector, but and and it may, it may be that those who are predisposed react the first time, and so therefore don't get a second dose. And those of us, those who didn't react to the first dose, won't react to subsequent doses. Although again, there is a small 
there's a small rate after the second dose. Um, how do, we haven't seen this with uh, the other adenovirus vectored vaccines, um, uh, specifically the Ebola vaccine um, that's been used. Um, and it may be that we just haven't used it on a wide enough scale in the right population. Um, if there's a genetic predisposition to it, or it might be something about the combination of the adenovirus vector with the SARS-CoV-2 spike inserted, because um, that may um, be triggering this. So really good question. I don't know the answer. Please. Yes. So is there any contra contraindication in the use of this vaccine, like in, in, um, somebody who is using certain medications or even has a, a pre-existing condition with thrombocytopenia? I think people who have thrombocytopenia or, or, or especially clotting disorder, so if I, uh, I wouldn't use this vaccine for them. Yeah. Please. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Mariano from Timor-Leste. There is a possible that the case of TTS can occur before 24 hours. I asked this one because there is a case in my country that uh, one lady with 60 years, 62 years old, after she got the vaccine, uh, we make observation during 30 minutes, but after one hour, and in the way her go back to home, just suddenly didn't come out for the nose, ears, and die at that time. No, it's, it, you need to have time for the antibodies to form. So I think that it, immediately after vaccination, it's really unlikely that the vaccine would be the cause of that. I mean, at least this mechanism would be the cause of that. Yeah. Please, Red first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so look, I'm the grateful recipient of both AstraZeneca and Janssen, probably not too many of that combo, but we saw, and the US wasn't the only country that did this, but huge increases in donations of Janssen and of AstraZeneca after countries essentially ban them in their own country or totally trash them. And these are often to countries with very young populations and often going predominantly to young women because they were the healthcare workers and the frontline staff. I understand the need to vaccinate, but also a lot of these countries didn't have huge COVID outbreaks. So how, and I still obviously <laughs> feel strongly about this, how is this justified even a few years later? That And like the messaging it sends out is just so bad. And I don't think that's ever been rectified. And I think it's created a lot more um, trust issues. How do you explain that to kind of the third or the half of the world that was the recipient only because they were the leftovers that other countries didn't want? I agree with you. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask that same question. And to be honest, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's amplified vaccine inequity. Yes. So we we were left with virtually only AstraZeneca and uh, Johnson and Johnson, and it's not just that we were left with these options. Even when people are suspected to have TTS, you really don't have the facilities to investigate them. Okay. So, to be honest, it puts into question the stand WHO took when these things came up. Thank you. The WHO still considers these vaccines to be safe and that the benefit outweighs the risk. Um, and um, like I said, these vaccines saved a lot of lives and a lot of hospitalizations. Um, do I think it's right that high-income countries abandoned them and sent them to low-income countries? No. Um, I don't know what would have been better, um, but, I, but I absolutely agree with you that um, it is important to have to, to be very frank about the, the potential benefits and to have each country and each institution and each person weigh their risks and benefits, um, their own personal risks and benefits with these vaccines. There's something on one of your last slides yeah. that is not up yet anymore. Um, it's about the genetic factors you mentioned. Um, yeah. I met Andy Pollard uh, um, a year, yeah, two I years think. ago, and, yeah. and he has certainly been the PI for the trials. And he said in Brazil, it was only the Caucasians that were affected, not the other population. Yeah. So it is a bit, I'm not defending anyone at all, but it is a very complex question. It is a very complicated yeah. question. I, 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 and I don't think we really understand um, 
and I was talking to Noni earlier, that the rates in Canada were lower than what was expected, that Canada is a very large immigrant, non-white immigrant population. And could that be the reason why the rates in Canada were lower than expected? So we'll continue, oh, please. Wow. Yes. Me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the, the use of the adenovirus platform in the future, if we would want to use it for new vaccines. Is there something we can do about the platform, looking at your mechanism, maybe playing with the surface charge or shielding the surface charge somehow? So I don't know how much of a role that that charge is, is how important that specifically is. Um, other groups have tried to replicate that data. Um, the... Um, there's certainly animal models of TTS now that can be potentially utilized to explore and see whether um, it would um, whether it would be generated. There's one paper that was published where if you gave the vaccine IM, you didn't get TTS, but if you gave it it's mice, and if you gave it IV to mice, then you did get TTS. And um, you know, just there's, so there's ways to to maybe start to explore that in the lab. I think it would be nice if we had a better understanding of who is susceptible and why. Um, you can't do personalized medicine with vaccines for a pandemic; uh, that doesn't work. But you can identify who may be at increased risk and who may be um, may be safer to use the vaccine. In. Yes, please. Hi. Uh... In your presentation, one of the slides were uh, where TTS episodes were much higher and in one of the countries it was much less. So do you think that is a reflection of stronger or a weaker surveillance system than the vaccine itself? Or there was any study that uh, was conducted later that could actually prove why was it so yeah. different in different populations? So we don't know why it's different in different populations. Um, I know that um, there, the rates are higher after um, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine than they are after the Janssen vaccine. Um, and so it may be that countries who used one versus the other had higher rates. But within countries that used the same vaccine and had different rates, um, many of those countries were, were high-income countries who had fairly good surveillance mechanisms. This is not subtle. This is, you know, getting a call from the ICU saying, I have somebody with this horrible syndrome that I've never seen before. Um, so it's... Um, so I think that there are, like, like, um, like Harry said, that there are, there are, there's got to be a genetic. Why do 99,999 99, people in Europe not have this problem and one person who gets a vaccine out of 100? And why is so many more, so many fewer people in India having it? And it, I think there's got to be a genetic component that we just don't understand yet. Please. Thank you. I'll be patiently waiting. So does the data definitely, I'm, I'm here. Does the data? Oh, thank you. <laughs> does the data it definitely tells us that at-risk populations is Caucasian under fifty women? No, no because I remember there so. were some questions at the very beginning. You know, where is it actually female that have higher incidence than male? Actually, female that have. It is actually female, yeah. and the the mechanism that we have shown us is there anything about this mechanism that could point us towards why is it female that are at higher? No, risk? but in a lot of autoimmune conditions, women are more at risk. So I don't know why that is. Um, but uh, but it's it is women under the age of fifty, so women of reproductive age, women who are premenopausal, who seem to have the higher risk. But not, I mean, you still get old men who have it, so it's not just one that. last question, please. Thank you. Um, from your slides, the African map. Yes. Uh, if my geography is correct, there is one country, and I think it's Chad, yeah. that did not use um, Oxford AstraZeneca, mm -hmm. right? Um, did it make any difference? And do you know why? I haven't seen reporting from Africa in terms of rates of TTS, so I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Okay. 